good evening everyone and for some of you good morning and for some of you good afternoon actually and for some of you good night because uh, we have an uh, uh, diverse set of panel today uh, we have uh, a panel uh, which is from across the countries and here uh, we are going to talk about covid 19 effects across the globe in education sector so uh, before i start the panel uh, let me introduce myself i am ravi gupta i am uh, founder and ceo of elets technology media private limited we have been bringing out a magazine called digital learning for past 16 years in print every month we have been also running a portal uh, on digital learning for 16 years and uh, we have organized uh, more than 200 odd conferences in the field of education across uh, 70 cities in the country and around 10 cities outside this uh, India. And uh, we also have a focus on ICT innovations uh, in health sector, governance sector, banking and finance sector and around 30 uh, more sectors. And we have, uh, we have the belief at ELETS that IT is a huge transformational uh, wave and each sector uh, will uh, get affected by it and it has to see that how much uh, it can absorb IT so that to uh, make it more efficient. And uh, today uh, we have this eminent panel from various countries and uh, instead of uh, me introducing about them because each of them have a different set of expertise, I will request uh, uh, each of them to introduce about themselves and their organization, their, their institutions. So I will start with uh, Pete Harwood. Uh, please uh, introduce about uh, yourself in uh, one or one and a half minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ravi. Um, so, uh, greetings to everybody who is attending this Mr. webinar. Uh, my name is Pete Harwood, and I'm currently working as a computer science teacher in London in the UK. Um, so, my previous experiences involved uh, teaching in India as well and, and in some other countries, and uh, it's a great joy to be part of this panel today. So my background before teaching was in uh, IT as a software engineer. So um, yes, I'm uh, the whole sort of shift with online learning and everything that's happening is something that I'm uh, particularly interested in. So thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you, Pete, for joining. Uh, great to have you here. Mm, and uh, here. we have uh, Dr. Aisha Siddika. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, everybody who's on board and those who are going to join us shortly. Uh, I am Dr. Aisha Siddika, uh, Director and Principal at uh, Dubai National School. Uh, I hold a doctorate in leadership and management. I have been uh, into instructional leadership now for about 26 uh, uh, plus years. And uh, I'm an educator by profession, but a coach by passion. I blend in coaching into my profession when it comes to uh, uh, performance uh, management systems uh, within the school setup. Uh, I have been uh, 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 learning a lot on positive psychology, uh, neuroscience and NLP. And I'm working currently in to see how that can also be integrating into the way we deliver curriculum into the classrooms. Uh, with a lot of work going on, how to enable students to, uh, you know, better develop their competences and skills. Uh, I'm like Pete, I'm also excited uh, uh, as we move through, navigate through these testing times uh, that COVID-19 has, you know, uh, thrown on us suddenly. And uh, we as uh, leaders uh, are finding ourselves, you know, I think more occupied than ever before in the way we are re-looking and rethinking uh, and redesigning the way we deliver education, mm. uh, the curriculum in our schools. Uh, excited to learn a lot uh, from the panelists, the esteemed panelists uh, here today. And I hope to share a, a bit of 
my own experience. Thank you very much again for having me, Dr. Ravi. Thank yeah. you. Welcome, Dr. Aisha. Great to have you here. Uh, we have uh, Olga from Russia. Uh, please introduce yourself. Olga. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olga Mitreva from Russia. I'm from Chibaksari. It is, it is a central part of Russia. And today uh, I have a great chance just to be a part of this panel. And I'm going to speak about current situation of COVID-19 in my country, of course. I think it will be interesting for everybody. Uh, and problems of secondary education at this period. The current issues uh, issues closely connected with teachers, students, and parents. And as for myself, I have been busy with secondary education as a teacher of Russian, or oh, sorry, I'm not uh, Russian, English, and uh, German. Uh, for about 30 years and about 25 years, I'm very deep in uh, international school projects. Uh, I had such projects with the United States of America, Great Britain, uh, American Field uh, Service, and uh, as Dr. Naman felt that oh, we were a part of uh, exchange program in India. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, just to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Olga. We are glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, we have an uh, expert from uh, Poland, uh, Magda Helena. Welcome. Uh, please uh, introduce about yourself and your organization, Magda Helena. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, my name is Magdalena Matulewicz, and uh, I represent Natural Leaders. Um, I am uh, from Poland, uh, but um, Natural Born Leaders is a UK-based um, training uh, provider. Uh, I'm currently speaking to you from Malaysia, where I'm uh, <laughs> on lockdown as most of us. Uh, okay, so my background, uh, I'm a UK-qualified assessor in early years education and school play work, a teacher trainer, um, and also a homeschooling parent. So both pathways, uh, formal education and home learning are very close to my heart. I'm, um, the last uh, 15 years, I've devoted myself to exploring personal learning, active learning and uh, nurturing how we can, as parents and educators, nurture children's natural leadership mindset. Um, so my uh, perspective is very global. For the last 15 years, we've been traveling the world uh, as uh, family, as a professionals, as natural leaders. So this has given us a chance to liaise and live with people around the globe and see the, the quality and uh, educational thoughts, uh, similarities and difference between us, uh, all of us, and uh, the condition of education uh, around the world. So I'm going to speak about the most pressing issue is in the early years education uh, in the view of current situation, also future-oriented learning. Great. Thanks for being here. Uh, uh, you have a, a great perspective from Poland, from UK to Malaysia. So I think you are like anyway global in your uh, all uh, experiences anyway. Uh, we now have Samira Parhatami with us. Uh, she is from Bangladesh and I will request her to introduce yourself. Hello everyone. Uh, uh, good, good, uh, good evening from, from Dhaka. I'm Samira Farhat Amin. I'm the founder and CEO of Education Excellence. Education Excellence, uh, we started promoting uh, British education in Bangladesh and also some parts of South and Southeast Asia. And uh, we do skill development projects with the Ministry of uh, Primary and Mass Education of Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, we do it in South, East, South and Southeast Asia. We do it in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and uh, uh, now we are looking at uh, Philippines, Egypt, and uh, Vietnam as well. So since we have been promoting British education in South and Southeast Asia for a long time, so we represent almost uh, 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 30, 40 universities of uh, UK, and I happen to be the country director for the University of West of Scotland uh, and uh, some other universities as well. And also we, we were the pioneer in introducing uh, uh, summer programs or study programs with the school students in the United Kingdom uh, with Bangladeshi students. So here I'm going to talk about the, during this pandemic, uh, the education system, uh, the, uh, the situation of Dhaka and also some part of uh, uh, the places that I work with. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Samira. Uh, great uh, uh, experience you have 
both uh, from the school sector and the higher education sector. So you can uh, give us uh, uh, both uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sapna Sukul from India. So Sapna, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, yes, Ravi, thank you so much for uh, uh, putting me with such extinguished and uh, sorry, eminent panelists. Um, I've been into education for past 25 years. And uh, uh, apart from the leadership role and being a teacher, I have also been into training, training with British Council as a core skill trainer. I'm a qualified AFS trainer where we have been training different schools. And uh, having said that, like I have uh, experience of training people, uh, children from abroad and teachers from different countries. I also uh, like to set up schools and be creative and uh, set up some curriculum and design curriculum and strategies for auditing of schools. Uh, I'm happy to be part of, and, um, of this panel and hearing from all of you. So that's it. Welcome, Sapna. And thanks for uh, taking a lead in organizing this uh, panel. Thank thanks. you, Ravi. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we have uh, Nargis uh, Kambata, who is principal and CEO in uh, GEMS uh, Modern Academy, uh, Dubai. So uh, Nargis, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you, Ravi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nargis Kambata. Um, no relative of Persis Kambata at all. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to share that um, I have been living in Dubai for the last, uh, I think, more than 25 years now. And um, Dubai, Oman, um, India as well, at the Dune School, Dehradun. Um, it's been a journey for me. And I have met some amazing educators on the way. And I think um, I've imbibed and learned uh, from all of them, as I hope to do today as well with our, with our lovely panelists here. Um, I, I do want to share that, you know, agile leadership is really what is important for any education. Leader. And with the rapid rate at which uh, the times are changing, we, who imagined? Six months ago, who imagined we'd find ourselves in this situation? But we've been thrown at the deep end, and uh, well, we're not sinking, we're swimming. And I think um, it's only going to get better along the way. Um, I also want to share that I am passionate about um, education purely because uh, of the impact it has on children. And I think children are the future generation. You know, Chief Seattle rightly said that you don't inherit the earth from your grandparents, but you borrow it from your children. And so what kind of world are we leaving for our children? Just before the COVID uh, problem broke out, we had um, a very extensive vision statement exercise. Um, and you'll be amazed to know that uh, we involved students, parents, teachers, everybody. Um, and we landed up with a seven word uh, vision statement. And it said, inspiring children to be positive change makers. And I think at the heart of what every educator does, that is what they want to do. And I hope at the end of this panel discussion, we would have inspired each other to be positive change makers. Thank you. Great uh, words, uh, Nargis. I think the, your words about that, uh, the children are the future and we are all like doing it for them. Uh, great uh, ideas. And uh, uh, now uh, we will uh, move uh, to the next round of the panel. Uh, where each of the panelists will uh, make a small five-minute uh, presentation on the COVID-19 situation and how they are uh, seeing the challenges and opportunities. And before that starts, I also welcome uh, our audience who are here right now on Zoom. We have around 187 people right now on Zoom and I think uh, more than 1,000 people are right now uh, seeing us on Facebook. So uh, all the audience, uh, please uh, uh, see that, that there is a uh, Facebook link of this uh, live session uh, being posted on the, uh, the chat uh, box. I will request you to please share it uh, from your Facebook so that more uh, people can be uh, benefited from this uh, discussion. So uh, let me start with uh, Pete uh, from uh, UK. Uh, Pete, if you can uh, start your uh, presentation and tell us about the situation and the uh, challenges and opportunities which are seen there. In of course. Next, uh, five minutes. Okay, thank, thank you, you Abby. And I will request all the panelists to be please on mute so that we 
don't disturb him by any chance. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. Yes. wonderful, thank you. Um, so, um, just really want to share for a couple of minutes about the situation we're experiencing uh, with COVID-19 in the UK at the moment. So, um, so just very quickly, um, the current situation, uh, the UK has been on a countrywide lockdown for three weeks now. And then this has just been extended for another three weeks. Um, it's essential travel only. And there's been at the moment around 15,000 fatalities due to uh, COVID-19. So that's the, the current situation. Um, what's the impact on education? Well, all schools closed uh, on the 20th of March. Um, but they remain open for children of key workers. So the government has come up with a list of certain uh, workers who are considered key workers like frontline medical staff, uh, the police, uh, food delivery people, um, those types of people. Um, and they basically, um, some of their children are going along to the schools. Um, so just to say from the five or six schools that I've been in touch with, um, they're getting about 1.5%, maybe 10 or 15 children um, that are still attending those schools with a skeleton staff of around five or six. Um, I guess probably one of the biggest impacts um, for education has been on those children who uh, were due to take exams uh, this year, as I'm sure is true across all the countries. Um, that are represented here today. So uh, for us, year six children doing SATs, uh, year 11 children doing GCSEs, and year 13 children doing A-levels, um, all of these exams have been cancelled and assessment is going to be based on teacher assessment rather than exams, although there will be some opportunity for um, uh, exams to be taken later if people are unhappy with the results that they are given. So uh, that's the immediate impact. So uh, how are lessons currently being delivered? Uh, so when the lockdown first came into place, um, a, a two week uh, home learning pack was produced. Um, and this was given out to all the children, uh, certainly uh, at the school that I attend, um, that was given out. Uh, my knowledge is that it was given out throughout many schools. Um, from that uh, point onwards, uh, work is being sent to children at home via school websites, via the Show My Homework app, uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Classrooms, and another app called Class Dojo, which allows parents to interact with children as well and teachers. Um, for children that didn't have an internet access, um, home learning packs are being produced and either posted via the mail or uh, hand delivered to homes. Um, some schools are choosing to do a timetable um, with children having to check in at certain times and others are kind of keeping a more free approach allowing uh, parents and children to work it out um, among themselves in terms of how they structure their day. Uh, so big question is, um, is learning happening? Um, so all the teachers I spoke to said, yes, it absolutely is happening, uh, but not at the same level that we would um, uh, see in schools. Um, work is generally being completed. Um, a number of teachers that I spoke to said that they are receiving back work from children that is being done, um, but not necessarily all children. Um, some schools are focusing on reading, uh, spelling and maths, um, other schools have taken an opportunity to have a more creative approach and uh, uh, kind of relaxing their focus on the key um, skills of reading, maths and spelling and are focusing on things like baking and gardening and exercise. So a slightly more holistic perspective. Um, there are some concerns, as I'm sure you would appreciate, uh, particularly for children with special educational needs. Um, are they at home getting that special help that they need from trained teachers? Uh, safeguarding um, is a big concern for teachers at the moment, particularly for children uh, for whom uh, school is a safe place and home perhaps is not 
a safe place. So there's a lot of concern for that. Uh, I know some teachers are checking in uh, regularly, making regular phone calls um, into homes to just find out and check on the status of those children. Um, the other concern is for technology. Obviously, not everybody has access to technology. Um, and so we, we're obviously concerned to make sure that there's not a gap for those that don't have the technology or the technological knowledge in place. And the government have recently announced the laptop scheme for children in year 10, um, but that's going to take some time to roll out. And that will mean that children will be able to borrow a laptop for a period of time. Um, okay, assessment. Um, there's not much happening at a primary level. Um, there's very little marking that's taking place, um, but feedback is being given uh, via email or via apps like uh, the Class Dojo app. Um, I think what's happening more is support is being given. So if, if parents or children are contacting teachers and saying, um, uh, my child is struggling with this, then the teachers are able to interact with them. But So it's more of that sort of support and interaction rather than assessment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the end of year grades are being given by teacher assessment rather than through examination. Um, there is more marking taking place in secondary schools. Uh, with pupils completing work online, submitting it in um, apps like OneNote and it being saved online and teachers responding to that. So yeah, so at the moment it seems to be less assessment at primary, um, a bit more assessment taking place in secondary. Um, interaction with parents has been generally positive. Um, there's been a lot of goodwill. I, I hope that that's something that's experienced by my other colleagues around the world. Um, there's a lot of goodwill. Everyone's in the same situation. Everyone understands uh, this is unprecedented what we're going through. And so parents are being um, generally quite positive. They're encouraging their children to work. Obviously, it's quite difficult uh, if you're a parent and you're at home trying to do your own job and at the same time trying to look after your child and supervise their learning. Uh, it is pretty challenging. And so that is, I think, is probably the biggest challenge that people are facing. Um, another sub challenge to that is obviously a parent's ability to guide their children in learning uh, also depends on their own academic know-how. So one of my colleagues, a deputy head at the school, said that um, there was some problem with parents obviously having to try and teach children mathematical skills that they weren't even aware of themselves because things had changed since they had been at school. So that is obviously one of the challenges. Um, the government haven't set any um, uh, position yet in terms of schools reopening. Uh, they're not likely to open in the immediate future. Some people have said possibly June. Um, that would be after the half term holiday. Um, everyone that I spoke to uh, said they believe there will be a phased approach to opening the schools, perhaps with primary schools opening first and maybe with alternating days. Uh, so perhaps like one class coming in one day and another class the next day, or even splitting the classes into half and having half a class in at a time um, to try and facilitate social distancing. Um, another thing that has come through is the possibility that those children from vulnerable families will be um, encouraged to come back to school first. Um, how will this affect the, children, the future? Um, the colleagues that I spoke to were generally quite positive about the impact of COVID-19 on the future of education. Um, families, uh, they think, will have a better understanding of their children's learning and what um, they're going through, what the national curriculum is, that type of thing, and will hopefully be more supportive of their children's learning in future. Um, teachers and schools online systems will hopefully be vastly improved as we've all suddenly had to make the jump to online learning um, and hopefully by the time things get back to more uh, normality um, we'll actually have realized the huge benefit of these technology uh, technological platforms and how we can use them to our advantage um, some of the uh, one of the big negatives is there is an expectation of widening learning gaps, especially for those pupils who receive little uh, support from 
uh, family members at home. Uh, so that's going to be something that's going to be, have to be caught up on when the children come back to school. And there's going to be a wide range of gaps there. Um, another couple of big positives just to finish off with um, is that COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to reflect on how we do things. Um, on the extreme busyness that we often experience in life today. Um, are there some things that we should drop that we've been doing just because we've been doing them? Uh, is this a chance to reassess, okay, what is really important in life? What is really important in education? Um, what should we continue and what should we stop? And another thing, perhaps a bigger focus on mental health and resilience. Um, that's me for now. That pretty much covers the situation in the UK. Thank you very much, Ravi, for the opportunity to participate in this. Thanks, sir. Pete, uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, your uh, presentation has covered uh, all aspects of the situation. Thanks for a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Aisha Siddika to kindly make your presentation? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, uh, a warm welcome uh, to all the uh, participants and also the, uh, the audience. Uh, well, let's understand the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, first and foremost, it's a, it's a, it's a, a health crisis. And uh, majority of the countries across the globe have uh, rightly decided to close the schools, colleges, universities. Uh, the crisis uh, currently crystallizes the dilemma that the policymakers across the globe are facing uh, between, you know, having had to close uh, the institutions, the educational institutions, which resulted in reducing the contact time and also at the same time, thankfully saving lives. And uh, then there are, there are other countries where they have been keeping the institutions open, allowing the workers to work and uh, trying to maintain their economy. However, whatever the case be, this, this, this severe short-term disruption, I think, is being felt by uh, many families around the world. And uh, uh, taking cue from what Pete said, Homeschooling uh, is not only a massive shock to parents' uh, productivity, but it's also uh, a huge shock to children's social life and learning because now there's a huge uh, change in their regular routine, a routine where they were uh, coming to school every day to learn, meet with their friends, their teachers, face-to-face, -face, and suddenly this teaching, this socializing has moved completely online. And, uh, uh, and not only has it moved online, uh, it's moving on a very, uh, I what I would say is untested and an unprecedented um, uh, scale. And uh, similarly, uh, taking cue from Pete's uh, presentation, uh, he was talking about assessments. Assessments are either being postponed. I think uh, the British curriculum, we could take a case in point, has suspended all his GCSEs, IGCSEs, ASA level examinations. And uh, we are not sure whether they are going to happen or we are watching uh, what's going to, how they are going to, things are going to shape up. And uh, uh, there is no marking. Uh, the formative assessments, I think, have been affected, impacted the most. Uh, however, some assessments are moving online. But then again, there's a lot of trial and error, I would say. And uh, there is a sort of uncertainty for everyone. Uh, uh, now, these interruptions, uh, I feel are not just short short term issue for all of us in the educational leadership or into teaching, but these uh, are definitely going to have long term consequences for the affected cohort. Let's not forget them. And my major concern is uh, that it's going to not only raise inequality, but then also uh, how are we going to find solutions to be able to uh, bring equity uh, get rid of this inequality and bring equity for all the stakeholders, including the students. Now, having said that, I think uh, uh, when uh, Nigo, uh, Narkish was talking about uh, uh, agility, agility leadership, uh, I, it just struck me that uh, the cronium 
VUCA that is being used so often today in the agile world that we are living in, and we often use this term disruption, that we need to disrupt the status quo. We should be doing things differently. And I think, uh, yes, after the American army, now suddenly we find ourselves in the VUCA world. Yes, this is the real VUCA world. And uh, uh, the, the, the enemy is the COVID-19 right now. And this enemy is making us, uh, you know, look at things not only in few sectors, but I think the most hard it is the education fact, uh, sector. And it's resulting in uh, us educators looking at new ways of uh, seeing and reacting to what's happening around us, uh, especially uh, in this pandemic times. Uh, going ahead, what I would li like to suggest here is for the, the, the new normal now, being in this, uh, this kind of disruptive atmosphere. I think the new norm for the school leadership, I would love to speak about what the leadership could do is three things. Uh, so that we rethink these three things in our own organizations. And uh, we are able to, you know, uh, make uh, the, 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 the impact, the negative impact minimal. Of course, it's going to be there. We are waiting, we are watching, we are cautiously uh, trying and testing things. Uh, our teachers are redesigning the way they are delivering their lessons. They are re, uh, rewiring uh, the entire setup. I think uh, uh, never before have teachers felt the pressure as much as they are feeling the pressure or not being uh, able to face their students face to face uh, delivering that learning. So the loss of contact time, the loss of learning uh, that's happening is going to have huge impact. Therefore, as school leadership, the new normal should be that the way we strategize our things, looking at the challenge, what the challenge actually is, why the challenge and how, what, why and how are we doing things within our own organizations? Uh, looking at the opportunity to accelerate the change within our own organizations, redesigning our systems as I said, keeping in mind the equity factor, uh, creating a culture of research and development. I think uh, very few schools, very few in educational institutions can boast of having a, a, a brilliant research and development uh, wing or department or teams within their own uh, teams of leadership. And I think now is the time that we should be strategizing on creating a culture, not only just building teams, but creating a culture of research and development not within the faculty, but within students as well. Rethinking the role of our teachers. Uh, we, I, 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 am, I am so delighted to be on this uh, wonderful panel today. Uh, uh, and one of the things, takeaways for me today is that I would be staying in touch with each one of these personnel today that I've met on this, uh, on this panel. Uh, because I feel we need to rethink the role of not only teachers, but also leadership we can no longer function as autonomous uh, organizations or bodies. We will have to look at teaching and school leadership as a team sport. We have never done that before. Yes, uh, in uh, bits and pieces here and there, thanks to what's the way things are shaping up in UAE uh, uh, with the new uh, educational framework that came in, uh, we, schools are collaborating. But isn't it a pity? I mean, I was, it's such a shame that Nigarish and me are just across the corner and we have never met before. And today is the first time that we are getting to see each other, you know, uh, virtually online. So I think that needs to change. We should be collaborating more. We need to strategize and see how we can make teaching and educational leadership more of a team sport rather than being an autonomous kind of a body in themselves. We would have to reimagine the business model of education itself. We will have to look into a strategize our budgets. What amount of budget has to be? I mean, there was this uh, question that was shared by Swapna in the flow, and I really like that. We will have to re we will have to strategize our budget, school budgets, and be without become making it a burden on the parents who are already paying the the enormous amounts of school fee. So, how as school leadership we are going to look into that? The next thing after strategizing would be stabilizing. How are we going to stabilize what we are going to strategize? How are we going to build capacity within our own organizations for our teachers, for our senior leadership teams, for our administrative staff, for our uh, support uh, and our ancillary staff? For, so each and every member of the school 
that is involved, that has to do with the stakeholders, the students, the parents, will have to look into building that capacity. We'll have to also look at catching and pollinating ideas. I was looking at this beautiful video, which was sent to me by one of my students yesterday, where she was demonstrating how, because she cannot take her flower pot outside. So what she was trying to do, she was trying to pollinate the flower within the, 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 the study area at her home with her parents. And I, it, it just struck me. I think it, we would have to have similar strategies for our ideas as education leaders. We will have to catch and pollinate ideas. We will have to respond to feedback from parents, from students, from educational bodies, from policy makers. We'll have to encourage, as I said, collaboration. We'll have to reflect and deliberate more and more. We will have to create some sort of signal from this noise, this din and noise that is taking place around us. And finally, I would end by saying we'll have to see how we are going to mobilize all of this. We'll have to ensure not just technology, places, especially in countries like India and other countries where, where we have uh, challenges, technology, the, uh, every student does not have access to technology. So we'll have to ensure an equitable access of resources in absence of technology. How are we as uh, educators going to reach each and every student? We'll have to mobilize our systems. We'll have to set up more streamlined systems to ensure uh, this uh, equitable access. We'll also have to uh, make adjustments in our schedules and in the way we look at the pro pro professional development of our teachers, taking cue from what Nigarish said, uh, uh, Nargish said earlier about uh, supporting uh, teachers, uh, you know, teacher well-being, teacher training, uh, uh, teachers being feeling supported at this time. Uh, not everybody would be as lucky or as equipped as Pete. Pete being, being an IT professional would find it very easy. But trust me, uh, I can vouch for teachers, uh, social studies teachers, geography, history, math, uh, even science teachers having difficulty in getting used to uh, this technology. And uh, therefore, we will have to think, uh, mobilize uh, uh, the professional development as well. And finally, I would end by saying once again, what I said earlier, we'll have to focus on building more connections. We'll have to focus on uh, more collaboration. I think this should become the new norm. And uh, I think COVID has uh, done that one bit in making us school leaders understand what kind of uh, agile atmosphere we are living in, the VUCA world, and uh, how we should be disrupting the status quo uh, frequently, and how we should be now strategizing, stabilizing, mobilizing ourselves in this current time of pandemic. Thank you very much for giving me this time and listening to me. Thanks, uh, Dr. Raisha. Great inputs, great perspectives on uh, redefining, re-evaluating everything which you, you just mentioned, and especially the focusing on the non-IT teachers who are having uh, uh, challenges at this time. At this time. So I will uh, move uh, to our uh, next speaker, and uh, I will uh, request uh, Samira from, uh, from Bangladesh to speak. <laughs> Samira, you are on mute. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I would like to um, provide an overview of the impact of COVID uh, in not only in Bangladesh education system and also some part like in you know, a global as well, global system as well. So um, in our country, we have, since I work on with the primary school teachers in terms of providing them teachers training program in the facilitating teachers training program in the uh, Southern and Southeast Asia. So I, I, I happen to see the difference in that way that uh, we have around 65,000 schools, more than 65,000 primary school government schools here. And all the schools are definitely like other countries now are closed uh, for some time. And uh, not that all the uh, government schools are, have that access to online education yet, because um, in our country, uh, we have... Uh, uh, rectified or we have uh, actually uh, 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 we have uh, found out this uh, COVID problem in uh, second week of March uh, like WHO um, announced or declared this as pandemic 
and uh, but in the private school sector the online education already has started uh, uh, there are few schools uh, private schools that have already started providing online education system which is a very good thing but in terms of providing like you know like a country like bangladesh we don't expect that you know that all the students in primary secondary or higher sec education level they will get this online education access um, having said that the it it support or the it related support to the students of our country is not very strong but it's quite um, uh, quite uh, satisfactory but um, definitely online education support will help them if they get that opportunity in terms of global uh, global experience or in terms of global education or foreign education admission i would like to say that you know most of the foreign education in the in the in the western part of the world now they are very confused about their intake like you know for september or for 21 january they are not still sure about their intake as we all not don't know what is going to happen tomorrow morning so uh, we are still hoping against hope that things will uh, uh, things will get a better shape or things will improve in next couple of months and then we will start the intake in the foreign universities or even if they start they're thinking of organizing or introducing the online programs as well uh, for undergrad and postgraduate programs that way uh, it will help enormously the international students uh, in term not only in terms of getting this uh, online education or the classes online but also that will save a little bit of financial pressure on them because that way they pay less tuition fees and also they save the uh, uh, living cost that way yes having said that the global exposure is not there like you know if you are studying uh, at your place or home in the home country in online and in the computer probably the top courses are fine or the probably the classes are like you know you are following the classes and you get the degree uh, in 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 course of time but Well, once you are in 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 a country like um, a western part of the world and you know think of studying abroad and get that global exposure it's 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 the ambiance it's the it's the weather it's the language it's the people around it's food it's uh, nature it's everything all all together it makes an global exposure so that will be missing for sure but uh, having said that uh, there are still some good points or good um, sides of this um, uh, challenging time Uh, and that is i would say that um, that is as i said like your know, online education will only help uh, more students to log in because uh, probably it will be reachable to more number of uh, people or the students in south asia or or in bangladesh and uh, it will reach out to more people and it will give that ex access to those people to have a foreign degree in a in a reasonable uh, tuition fees i would say like i was talking to one of our colleagues in the, in uh, from uh, usa that they're going to provide their program is 2 plus 2 it's like you know 2 plus 2 years in a community college and 2 years progression to a good prep, uh, 100 uh, public universities in the usa but um, now they're they're going to offer that online programs so that way students are like you know even in 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 terms of international students getting visa is also a challenge sometimes for some students so that way when the students will have the opportunity to study sitting at home and paying 50% of the tuition fees which is as uh, usually the 50% less than the international tuition fees which is a huge huge savings for the parents that way and also after completion of one year or two year of education online if they start uh, if they apply for the visa for third or fourth year it may be a positive sign or it may be uh, uh, it will maybe give a, a better opportunity or better um, extra mileage to those students that's what i feel in the in the global um, uh, international admission sector um, one we also do the uh, teachers training program as i said in south and southeast asia if i talk about indonesia malaysia or in sri lanka for instance like you know this teachers training programs will be immensely um, affected Uh, are already affected by by this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, but we can still provide that online education program but online education program as i said will not give them that extra mileage or that global exposure even during the south and southeast asia so that way it's a it's 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 a bit challenging at the moment but i would still say that promoting or introducing online education is is always like you know a, a solution in that way
and uh, in terms of uh, promoting or uh, facilitating summer camps or study camps in the in in different countries i would say that it's a challenge for any student at this moment because we are it's not only traveling will be banned or are banned for some time it's like a i think the fear factor will work in the in the in the human mind or our mind for some time so uh, having said all these uh, uh, limitation i would still say that there this any any uh, 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 any limitation or any challenges opens opportunities we all know about it and um, we we can only hope that you know this will uh, when we the lockdown gets over and when the things get improved we only can hope for a better opportunity and better world but um, having said all this i would still say that there is a beautiful change that the world uh, has got now out of this um, uh, this covid 19 that is um, people are staying home during this lockdown and children are getting more time from the parents and i i have uh, we have all experienced i'm sure that you know children are getting i happen to be i have my experience in teaching uh, in school uh, primary school and secondary school for 7 8 years and i had my uh, own school for uh, slow learners so i have that experience like you know and i can connect and relate to whatever you are saying who are directly involved in uh, school schooling or school industry so i would say that you know this is a beautiful thing that students and children are getting more opportunity or getting more time from the parents and it will it is a great education as well like you know i think uh, uh, of education or what you learn from family or what you learn from home is uh, is very very important for a child and um, that that way i'm happy in a way that during this lock down the students or the children could get some some time from the family parents and could spend some time at home so thank you very much i i i had to tell talk about the international uh, platform only yes thanks so uh, samira a uh, great uh, perspective on the higher education scenario the delayed admissions or the perhaps online education setting in, in the higher education sector uh may i uh, request uh, our speaker from uh, poland to speak uh, mandalina please okay thank you so welcome again hello everyone again uh, so just to mention i specialize in early years education this is uh, my main focus and i would like to offer you perspective um, as an uh, as a professional and also as a parent a homeschooling parent as a world uh, traveler a global citizen so uh, being an assessor in the early years education uh, i was trained to see the bigger picture and a detail at the same time in a very short time because this is the the skill set that we need when we help teachers establish certain standards within a setting so traveling the world and living uh, and living not only passing by by living in more than uh, 30 countries allowed me to develop a global perspective and a view on uh, the status of and a condition of early childhood education around the globe and also allowed me uh, to see the details and those details uh, uh, through talking with families with parents uh, with teachers with trainers visiting playgrounds uh, play spaces for children so uh, up to, until now so we talk about before covid and after covid and, and covid situation but for me as an independent observer um, and although we are uh, entering in the uncharted waters we all might say and uh, and using different strategies and tools to offer education if, to my perspective is that not so many things have changed really but we have an opportunity to address the changes to make a real shift uh, observing the condition of early years education on a global scale so uh, allow me to see that most of us in most countries the 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 way that education even early early primary education is delivered is still in the majority uh, focus on academic achievements on um, literacy numeracy um, goal academic goal and it happens through uh, majority it happens through structured or 
pre-structured uh, learning education. And in early years, it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue because early years, these are the form formative years where children develop um, holistically. So um, also traveling the world, uh, I observe that there are clusters and groups of educators who are highly, highly motivated to make this change. And pre-COVID, I've worked with them, I've seen them, I spoke to them, and uh, I've seen the passion with which they want to facilitate this great paradigm shift in education. The paradigm shift towards active learning, towards a child-centered education, towards future-oriented education. So let me share uh, uh, what I mean by that uh, with you. Uh, just a second. So if we, um, if we look at learning, we talk about passive learning and active holistic learning. And if, if you can uh, see at the screen, the majority uh, of time still now is spent on passive learning, which is pen and paper learning most of the time. And now with the challenges, the tendency is to navigate towards technology-based learning. While technology can be a wonderful tool uh, to trigger, to help with education, we need to be very careful because um, it's, it's still based on passive learning. So if we continue this way, nothing will change that much because we will, we will just change the tool from workbook, from, uh, from worksheet. We will navigate towards a laptop or a tablet. So it will still be more or less passive if we, if we prioritize this kind of learning. This is not to say that we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't use technology, we shouldn't do a worksheet. But if we prioritize this kind of learning, we are reducing the opportunities for children to develop poor life skills, which is all that learning, and especially in the early years, is all about developing uh, holistically, physical, emotional learning, emotional, uh, emotional education, language, communication, reasoning. So these are all the, all the skills and that are developed essentially in the early years and they will stay with children for life. So with the current crisis, we have a chance to observe and address those, those issues that have been, may, many of us educators, we have been trying to facilitate this change even before COVID. So now we have a great chance to do it again, to, 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 see, um, to see that it is an opportunity to navigate towards a holistic learning. We can use technology as a trigger in a balanced way to trigger this active learning, whether it's home situation or whether it's after COVID in, in preschools or even early primary years. And we can, uh, we can think about ways to promote and integrate as much active holistic learning as possible into the education sector. And why is it so important apart from children's holistic uh, well, well-being and health? These are essentially um, ways in which children are really able, actually the only ways, and they are able to develop future-oriented skills and mindset. Because as much as academic education is uh, to a certain extent needed, it will not help our children uh, adjust to situations like now, yes? Now we need, we need to be able to adjust. We need to be able to find solutions to problems. We need to be able to um, to, to think critically, creatively, to reimagine our life and even on the spot, overnight, because this is actually what happened, yes? Um, as one of you said, we never imagined this six, six months ago, that something like that would happen. But many educators and parents, we were talking pre-COVID about future-oriented learning, what it is, what it means for, our, for education, for our children, for, for teachers, for parents, for teacher training, for parent training what kind of skills we want to, what kind of mindset we want to offer our children, what kind of education we really want to facilitate, yes, with help of technology and other wonderful tools. This has to navigate towards whole person active learning. Well, children can discover who they are. They express themselves in many ways, using their bodies, using their voice, using many other tools. And technology is also one of them, yes, but there are so many other tools. So we need to foster positive self-image of children, for them to be confident users of their bodies, of their, of their talents, 
to help them uh, be aware of who they are so that they can share those gifts with the world in a confident way because only then they will be help, able to lead in the future with their talents. So we have a wonderful chance right now to facilitate this kind of education, to bring it forward finally. And uh, this has to be a collaborative effort between education sector and parents. So uh, and it boils down to training again. We need all of us, whether parents or teachers, we need to learn how to offer active learning, not only pen and paper based, not only technology based. We need to learn how to use all palette of tools, yes, all environments, all experiences. And even now when we are at home, we need to, we need to know how, sorry, we need to know how to, how to use technology to support active learning at home. And this is not very difficult. Yes, parents can do it with collaboration with teachers. And this is what our mission is about as natural born leaders, to help teachers and help parents bring this massive change to the world. Active learning, holistic learning. And this is the kind of, the kind of support we offer parents and, and, and educators. Uh, trainings uh, that, are, that are assisting them to facilitate this change. But we need to do it together. We need to prioritize active learning uh, as a way forward. So, uh, so, so that parents, they don't need to think that I need to be a teacher, I need to teach, I need to structure learning at home. It doesn't have to happen because you're not teachers, you're parents. You, need, you have different kind of relationship with your children and home is a different kind of environment than school. In school, structured learning is, is supported by uh, by an effort of many educators at the same time. At home, you are alone, sometimes with your partner, sometimes not. But you need to be able to offer emotional support to your children, maintain the relationship that you have with them. And this cannot be compromised by uh, adding on top of that additional artificial structures, like creating a school at home. This can be done in a much easier way and um, in a very, very natural way. And even the best way is to follow the child, to follow the child and see what they want to learn, what they want to discover and prioritize the holistic learning, especially now and in the emotional aspect rather than academic. So uh, to finish this, I would like to offer uh, to, all, to, to parents a gift, uh, a gift and support you with, uh, with leading the way forward. Um, uh, complimentary modules from us, uh, for much of leaders that you can explore together with your family and you can see how wonderful journey you can prepare in these times uh, without without stressing that you need to really uh, change your roles from parenting to teaching so i hope that through collaborative effort of educators present here and the listeners and parents we can facilitate this beautiful change and and the paradigm shift so you can you can find the the link uh, to this uh, complimentary materials from us as a as a courtesy and thank you Great, uh, Magdalena, thanks for uh, giving a perspective on the holistic education uh, angle uh, instead of the traditional model on books. Uh, and uh, may I request Olga from Russia to please Hello. speak next. Yeah. yeah, I'm ready. Well, I tell that I'm a teacher of the secondary public school. My school is a high one. And as for me, I'm a teacher of English and German and uh, the coordinator of international programs in my school. Uh, at first, I'd like just to tell some words about COVID, but uh, I don't want just to be uh, too deep in this situation, of course, you know, or you can know all this, well, just um, situation in Russia uh, from different resources. At first, we are on the 10th place now with infected people, uh, but uh, what is well just uh, good for us not so many deaths it is really better than in other uh, countries and as for us i would like just uh, to tell uh, that my topic is education uh, is education is calling uh, i think in these situations we are well just in not to say that we're in a poor situation i mean the globe but uh, we should uh, share all our views about it and try just to have the best from this situation. Uh, I communicate with a lot of friends from many uh, countries, uh, and of course, and from my country, I mean teachers, and I'm uh, in full solidarity when I read about the position of school and educators nowadays all over the globe. 
School is not closed for the year, the buildings are closed, but uh, if all of you listen, you can hear the hum of hardworking teachers, uh, administrators and support staff preparing to save the day in ways and means never seen before. Most of us are broken hearted, but these broken hearts will leave, just imagine. We are now uh, well just positions and of course uh, teachers are teachers. Uh, as one of my friends tell, the teachers all over the world are working so very hard, uh, like honeybees silently trying to fill out hives with nectar, a uh, honey of knowledge and education to be used by mankind in these days to come. Uh, and now I'm just, uh, well, just deep in a triangular relationship between teachers, students, and parents. Uh, as for, well, just at first I thought that uh, as I tell when uh, the lockdown started here, quarantine time, I thought that teachers were captured and ordered to teach, students were captured and ordered to study, and as for parents, they were captured and recommended well just to educate their children at home. But uh, the situation is, uh, I think, is not so well just uh, negative as uh, I thought at first, but uh, a lot of resources for teachers, parents, and students we have here and uh, all of them are free of charge. And I don't want just to speak much about it, but if you remember Peter's um, speech, uh, we have much from it, really. Uh, and um, if I say that we are deep in a huge amount of resources, it is true. We have a lot uh, of them and of good quality, more than 20 online platforms. But uh, as for Unified Platform, it is, uh, it was not created. Uh, we use different internet resources. And uh, I would like just to say that what this uh, COVID-19 gives us nowadays. At first, uh, we are all of us uh, deep in time management, I think. Uh, then self-education as for teachers and maybe even just parents. Uh, well, creativity for teachers. As for me, for example, and uh, many other teachers, it's a high time just to find new contacts through the world, as I, I'm doing now. And as for families and as for parents, I think deeper and friendly relationship are uh, uh, just um, in their families now. But uh, we have different families as uh, the whole world, of course. And sometimes they have problems and uh, I'm a school mistress, uh, class mistress. And of course, uh, I'm always on um, chat line with my parents. And uh, well, how was our distant education organized? At first we were well just informed that uh, the starting point will be well just from April the 1st. And as for the day uh, just to stop it really we don't know uh, now. Uh, all our assessments and uh, state exams were of course on uh, the dates were changed and uh, it will happen only in June uh, from the 8th of June but uh, as for the students I think most of them are eager to come to school with joy and happiness because uh, what is negative in all this situation? Of course, the lack of communication. Well, um, yeah, we communicate every day. We have lessons, we have, well, just chat lines with uh, parents and so on and so forth with teachers. But uh, real communication, of course, uh, quarantine time doesn't give us it. Uh, and uh, as for my students, they told me that uh, they will come to school with joy and happiness and the lack of communication, the atmosphere of school are factors which are mentioned by teachers, students, and parents as well. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Olga, for uh, being a perspective, uh, bringing in a perspective from Russia. Uh, the challenges are similar, and I think uh, we will have to find solutions, each of us customized to our own situations. Uh, may I request uh, Nargis uh, Kambata uh, from Dubai to speak next. Uh, welcome, Nargis Ji. Thank you very much, Olga. It was very interesting listening to you and Magdalene and um, Samira before me. 
uh, I think you all have brought in a really, really good perspective and you've put a different lens to, uh, um, you know, the things that are happening at your, at your end of the, of the woods, so to speak, in your part of the world. Um, I am actually going to speak to you about uh, two things. One is, how do we get teachers ready to take on this challenge? Because at the end of the day, they are the key stakeholders here that we really need to um, you know, look at. And I have some teachers sitting here on this panel itself. On this panel itself. Um, I'd also, I'm, I've been following those questions very, in a, in a, you know, some very interesting questions have been asked. And I know we'll answer those questions later. So for all those of you who are looking for a non-technology solution, um, I wish there was another, I'm sure there will be another panel to answer that, or we'll answer that later. So that's not what gonna, I'm gonna touch on now. If that disappoints you, I'm sorry, uh, but I am gonna be a little more focused on technology. So, um, but, but for those of you who are interested, you must follow Sugata Mitra's work, because Sugata Mitra, I don't know if you've heard of SOL, the Self-Organized Learning Environments, and he did this amazing, amazing uh, experiment called, uh, uh, um, I think it was hole in the wall experiment, where he put in a, um, he put in a, uh, you know, a, a, a computer in a wall in a village and just left it and how the children organized themselves and they learned. And he was amazed at how much learning happened without a teacher being present. So they're very humbled by the potential of students to learn. And we always say that it is not always the teacher who makes the student learn, but it is everything that the student experiences. And therefore, when we talk to our teachers, we always say, so what are the experiences you are crafting for the students? We never say, uh, what are you teaching? We always try and say, how are you going to ensure the students learn? So we shift the focus from teaching to learning. And if you put on that hat, uh, if the teacher put on, puts on the learner's hat and thinks, how am I going to make sure that my students learn rather than how am I going to teach, then there's a whole paradigm shift. Um, so when this happened, we realized that uh, we've got to very quickly do two things. One is take care of, our, of the well-being of our teachers. And the other is we've got to equip them because, you know, anybody is anxious. Supposing you are asked to go out and, and learn German and teach German tomorrow and you don't have the capacity, you can't do it. So uh, we said how to reduce anxiety levels among teachers first, because, you know, anxiety can be transmitted so easily. So if a teacher is anxious, he or she is going to transmit it to students as well. And so we decided that, so we brought in our CIDO, it's a special uh, term we've introduced for a very special person who works in our organization, our chief innovation and digital officer. And it's not always about, innovation is not always about technology, but this time it was. And so he and his team worked very, very rapidly. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen with you to show you the, um, I don't know if you can see this, I presume you can. Um, so, so the first thing, like I said, is to make sure that the teachers were prepped, the students were prepped. And so what did we do? We took on a five pronged approach. And if you look at this, uh, we start, first started with on mass training. What, what did that mean? We meant, that meant that to use a platform, we used Microsoft Teams only because it was more secure. And we said, in order to ensure that we are able to use Microsoft Teams properly and carefully, all teachers need to be trained, all students need to be trained, all parents need to be trained. That's why that word on mass, because everyone got trained. And despite the training, I have to share with you, uh, friends, that sometimes, the, you know, the students are smart, they are, they just sometimes were able to lock the teachers out. So the teacher thinks that the teacher's teaching, but the students are thrown out of the online class. And those were a couple of funny moments, but our technology team came in and, and we quickly figured that out. And then we went on to tutorials, those who want to do the more advanced learning. So we gave them guides and video tutorials to learn how to explore and exploit the platform. So that was about the tutorials and then once the learning really took off we said how do we support them so our tech people actually beamed in live and they helped sort out all the tech issues and in the first week there were plenty i don't think educators slept well at all during that first week there were plenty of tech issues we're talking about large schools here schools where uh, you know uh, there are 30 to 40 children in a class. Um, there's a teacher and a teaching assistant. I know in some parts of the world it's different. We have up to 60 students in a class. Uh, well, uh, that, that was something that we had to sort out. Um, resources, we had to share the resources and make made sure that um, not any and all, if you go into the World Wide Web, you can get confused. There are so many resources on there. So how do we curate and pick out the best ones? So it was a very small team of dedicated people who enjoyed doing this kind of work 
you know, they say when you when you do what you're passionate about, then you really get fantastic results. And that's what we did. We really gave that core team this job to do. And of course, we as leaders prepared a remote learning guide for everyone. And then we went on to micro sessions and on demand sessions where, you know, we did all of this work with teachers and students. And I'm very pleased to share with you that student training is as important as teacher training. Um, and all of these sessions were held. And then I think, um, I think teachers being teachers, they know how to share best practices very, very well. And so we had, we call it the teacher hack session, where the teachers themselves uh, were explaining to others whatever little nuances and techniques they need. I want to introduce this uh, Punya Mishra and Matthew Kohler's model. I'm sure everybody knows this. I'm directly addressing the educators here. Sorry, parents, sorry, anybody else, the educators here. So we've always known that, uh, you know, content is king and that it is content that really is going to be delivered. But it's not about just transmission of the knowledge. Initially, when we started off with, uh, with you know, this, this kind of remote learning, it was an emergency situation. So we just were floundering and, you know, there was really no, um, you know, no instructional design model to help us deliver this. Um, and it was this content knowledge that we said, how do we deliver it in a regular classroom situation? Well, it's the pedagogy. It's the, it's the method of delivery that's important. And now we had to quickly use technology. So you see the sweet spot in the center. That sweet spot is called TPAC. And that TPAC is when you combine technology intelligently with the pedagogical methodology and you deliver the content. That truly elevates your, your uh, student learning. And so um, this is something that our teachers use all the time. Um, coming to nurturing teacher well-being. So there were so many things that we have got to do to make sure that the teachers um, you know, really feel supported. And like I said, if they're anxious, everyone's going to be anxious. So to calm them down, we did all that training, but then constant positive messaging, check in. So we constantly are calling our teachers, especially in a place like Dubai, where some people are staying alone and away from their families. We call in and check in on them. We have tea, as you can see here, tea with the supervisor and the head of the section. So they just sit together with their cups of tea, um, like so many people are doing now. Um, and, and there's just so much of, uh, you know, really interesting stuff. I also want to share with you one more thing. We have, um, you know, a provider here who is, um, is known as the Knowledge and Human Development Authority. And this provider, sorry, I'm just trying to fix this. Yeah, this provider, the, the KHDA, they truly are proactive in terms of uh, equipping everybody. You know, it's, it's like the CBSC board or the ICSC board um, coming forward to help. And so this is what, uh, you know, they do. They give us absolutely, you know, timely notifications and updates. They're very, very open about their communication with all stakeholders. They send out surveys directly to students, directly to teachers. Um, you know, they support us with FAQs and resources. And of course, there's a school, uh, you know, connection, the submission of plans, they hold us accountable, uh, because, <clears throat> I mean, education is taken very, very seriously. I'm again apologizing to those who are looking for a non-technology solution. I'm only talking about technology solutions. Yeah, I'm sure we will uh, address that later. And if you look at the effectiveness of the distance learning, it, you can see how considerate they've been. They've put it in two stages. The first stage talks about the provision and the plan. What are your remote learning plans? But the second stage is, what is the impact and the effectiveness? So they've let us be quiet for the first couple of weeks and they said, you focus on your provision and your plan for remote learning, but then you've got to think about how is this creating, because you know, it's the three I's. One is the intent, the other is the implementation, the third is the impact. How is this impacting our students? And so um, how do you, these are the three areas. I'm not going to bore you with this. I just want to, I'm going to stop sharing this. And I, I just want to end by saying that, um, you know, this is new territory for all of us. So many of my colleagues have said so many wonderful things and I, and I endorse most of it. Um, but these are unprecedented times. Uh, we know that students learn in different ways than we learned, completely different ways. And if we try to teach them in the way we learned, we're going to fail. Well, even now, looking at what's, gonna ha what's happening now, even, even we don't know how to teach. The best part is it doesn't come with an instructional manual. COVID never came with an instructional manual, manual for educators. And there is no manual. And the good news, that was the bad news. The good news is we're constructing that manual on the go. 
Isn't that wonderful? And never before, I think, have educators ever had this opportunity to, to come together to, you know, kind of leverage the, our own understanding, knowledge, and, and expertise uh, and really help uh, each other. So with that, I'm going to end because I think staying positive is really important. And Dr. Ravi, Sopna, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I think um, I'm sure all of us are going to keep in touch. Even for the panelists, you've asked some really interesting, I'm sorry, for the uh, attendees, you've asked some really interesting questions. And we certainly will try to help you answer that one. Thank you. Fantastic uh, presentation, Nergis. Uh, I enjoyed and learned a lot from there. Uh, May I request uh, Sapna to kindly speak now? Uh, thank you all panelists. They've covered almost uh, all the sessions, uh, every topic they've covered. So I would like to speak about what is education under lockdown. So what had happened when this suddenly this pandemic stuck us? So what was our mood, all of us across the world? Like uh, we were first was, what, what was it? We were complacent. Like uh, we were all uh, just taking it. It's like any other fever and this too shall pass. Then we had this attitude that, okay, this will not come here. Maybe it is in XYZ country. But then when it set in, we were under this fear, this like, what will happen? We started holding things. We started uh, just collecting every news bit and starting mustering that courage, courage how to go about. I'm just talking from human perspective because we have covered all the education um, aspects of education. So I thought, let us go deeper into it that what is COVID-19 all about? Then we came into third phase, what I feel is into the learning phase. Now, as educators, as um, corporate workers and everything, we are into this third phase right now, which is like learning phase where we are analyzing new things and comparing uh, information with all friends, like what we're doing today and we've been doing for so far, that what are we doing? How? What is the way forward? Like Nargis said that we all are discovering ourselves. Isn't it amazing that we don't know what we are going to do ahead? We are just discovering. And then for so on that like we'll be going forward with this. Now I was just going through the data analysis uh, with uh, World Economic Forum that what is the impact and how many how many people are suffering through this. So estimated cost effect was 1.57 billion students are at home today in a 191 countries. So imagine the impact. And in India itself, there are 320 million students affected by COVID lockdown. 19 lockdown. So India is like six countries put together and we are fighting this battle. But um, what is it like? What are the children missing? I understand when there is, uh, and India is like from north, like we are, I must really appreciate the country's uh, vision that how we are coping up with this stress because it's uh, rapid. But what are the children missing during these days is the peer learning because uh, we can provide education through online we can do best of the uh, education is best of learners can come and learn but they are missing their peer they are missing their sports and games that we cannot provide digitally they're missing their theater activities their band concerts their adventure camps they're chilling out together so this is what i think none of the technology uh, i don't think so we can virtual world can provide this this is where uh, i think covid 19 is providing us an insight that uh, don't take um, we will take it more seriously when it when everything opens up. Now, should we call COVID-19 a pandemic or a revolution? So according to me, it is, what is it? It's pandemic is, uh, it's a more like a revolution and we are part of this revolution where we are the chain makers. Today's generation is chain maker because we all know that what happened during French Revolution, it was a reign of terror. It had given, uh, French Revolution was what, uh, like there was guillotine, then there was birth of France, but something good came out that French nationalism uh, was there. And then second, what happened in the Industrial Revolution? Industrial Revolution, again, there was poor work condition, child labor, everything was going wrong. But living standards improved later, unionism was emerging out. I'm just trying to say that how we should look forward that what good will come out later. Now, even uh, like Olga will agree, like what happened in, during the Russian Revolution, had, like gulags and civil war was happening everywhere, but had, and this was the defeat, had uh, what, like Hitler was defeated, Hitler, this was the time when Hitler was defeated, and this is how we could uh, get Russia. So 
every revolution, there's something good and big is going to come out. So COVID-19 is more than pandemic. It's a very big revolution. And we are part, as educators, we are the main change makers today. We, along with all of us across the world, we can connect and we can make this change and we can be history once, maybe after 20 years when we talk about it, we will be the, we will be noted in the books that this, this generation was the one who made this new rule book. So yes, all of us have talked, uh, spoken about the online, uh, like Pete agreed, uh, so many online uh, modules he has discussed, Magdalena has uh, about preschools, then um, every all school leaders have discussed that how their school is functioning. Olga has discussed about Russia, like how. So every uh, Samira has discussed about distance education and how higher education is going to come and it's going to be more online. But this is what online strategies, which all have been talking. So I'll just uh, go with without this, uh, maybe elaborating on this. So what is, like we all as educators, we know what is the online teaching methods. The first, as a trainer, I always used to tell, like just before the lockdown, I had a workshop and I told them that we are going to enter a VUCA world. And everywhere I used to tell them what is VUCA world. And I, we did not know that VUCA world is just right, like a thunderstorm, it's just across my doorstep. And uh, just maybe five days before the before all this happened, I was telling them, you know, what is VUCA? It is it is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and it can come any day. And teachers used to say, yes, ma'am, it is going to come. What is it going to be? And uh, when we take uh, uh, workshops on critical thinking, problem solving, I used to give them situation and they used to come up with, like, this is what VUCA world is going to look like. And we are there. Now it is a VUCA world. So rather than saying what is it going to be, we have to, uh, this the new acronym which we have just discovered is it's vision. VUCA is vision. U is understanding. Instead of uncertain, now it is more understanding. Instead of being complex, it's more courage. We have to develop courage. And instead of being ambiguous, we have to adapt. So this is the new definition of VUCA which I just discovered a few days back from a panelist. So new VUCA will get new skills for teachers and mental health will be addressed. So this new acronym which has come up that FOBA, fear of being alone. So uh, I think uh, we as teachers, we as chain makers have to address the FOMA and the FOMA. This is not uh, the fleet officers, the naval officers, Olga, but uh, this is like fear of being alone, fear of missing out. So mental health will be uh, the main issue which will be coming up very soon because the moment lockdown is over what is it we are going to prepare the children for like we have, we have been talking about social distancing how are the schools going to function where will we get this fear how will okay we understand the assessments and it, all these you bring the technology will bring in what about the other things how are we going to predict the jobs for the new age which is going to be prepared for 2030 because generation z and generation a we do not even we have not even like according to world economic forum we have not even created those jobs which are going to exist in 2030 we do not know what kind of jobs we are going to uh, these children are going to be offered so we are those chain makers where we are going to um, policy makers where we are going to think about the jobs now not only the education system about exams and assessments but what sort of jobs we are going to uh, give uh, offer these children again we are going to um, i think we are going to be more stringent about the policies what sort of policies we are going to bring for climate change it's not just on pen and paper but it, how much is it going to be implemented and especially about animal rights which we have not been discussing in most of the forums that Animal rights is something which uh, I feel it should be addressed uh, and it should be addressed very aggressively with educationists, with students, with all policymakers that COVID-19, what are the real changes which we are going to bring along, apart along with technology? And as we all have been talking about the new definition of education, which I thought will be like we are just facilitators. As uh, we all said that uh, the principal is not just an autonomous body because it's more like we are just facilitators. We are like uh, an acronym which we have just come across. Is it's more like PTPA, Parent Teacher Partnership Program. So it's everything is going to be a joint program, which the new school I feel um, and we all feel that the new system which we are going to develop will be more like a PTPA, P 
parent teacher partnership association so teachers will just be facilitators knowledge providers teaching life skills will be based more about our experiences which we carry so critical thinking problem solving is the most creativity cognitive development emotional intelligence which is a very um, strong course which i feel that we should be drilling it into our children from the very beginning because they are part of this revolution and how are we making them emotionally strong how are we managing people people management how are we dealing with as uh, nargis said that how to deal with teachers at because uh, it's uh, the teacher is the main task force that how are we dealing with them this time that what are we going to do that they keep they are like our pillars where they are taking this uh, education way ahead coordinating coordinating with others like everywhere like um, nargis and uh, asma just said that they are in dubai and they were not able to meet so often so how are schools going to coordinate with each other not only uh, with one district with, with one country but we should have more such conferences online where we can exchange notes and we can understand that what and how we can take the education sector forward and the uh, decision making is uh, very important because we have to see that we have to take some decisions and move forward rather than just uh, uh, debating and discussing but decision making is a very big skill which we should be teaching our children from now now onwards being uh, so this is what i feel that um, covid 19 has uh, been part of my learning because every day uh, listening to many eminent speakers and participating in different discussions and learning that teachers are not replaceable technology will come in but we do need teachers so teachers are very very important secondly what i have seen is that um, a country like india where we are all standing together like a, a rock of gibraltar we are everyone together we are um, participating in discussions and at this time uh, there is uh, immense uh, work happening in the government sector with technology where education is being uh, delivered uh, to far fetch yes i understand that internet is a issue some at some places but indian schools are also doing everything what we has been talked about they are using all all uh, google framework they are using microsoft they are using zoom they are using classes are being conducted um, like uh, byju's then a uh, lot of other uh, publishers and online digital media have has come into schools and we are doing uh, immense work in school sector from north west east and south so this is what india has been up to and everything is going on with good speed and yes assessments and all will be seen later because this has just been a phase where people are trying to settle down and uh, we have our lockdown till 4th of may after that we the government will decide but i am sure that uh, social distancing will be there schools i doubt that they'll open till june rest uh, go day by day because uh, we make plans and we don't know what will happen so um, i think uh, i end my note here thank you so much thank you ravi thank you all the panelists and looking forward to hear some more points thank you very comprehensive uh, presentation sapna thanks for uh, such a detailed uh, perspective uh, now uh, let us uh, move to the questions and i think uh, we are anyway uh, very uh, late in this uh, presentations so i will request each of the panelists to uh, pick up the question or questions uh, which you may combine Uh, two three questions and answer it together, since uh, there is less time and uh, many questions are similar and related to each other. So uh, may I start with uh, Pete and uh, I will request each of the panelists may uh, take three to four minutes to answer, so that uh, each panelist get uh, gets a uh, time to address the question. So uh, let me start with. Uh, Pete, uh, have you uh, checked the questions and you want to address some of it? Pete? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi. Um, uh, yes, some very interesting questions that people have um, uh, uh, put forward to the panel. Um, I guess the first one that I want to address briefly first is somebody um, asked a question about what about low tech situations? Um, because a lot of the schools represented here are schools or uh, places in, in, in the world where um, we have technology available to them. What about low tech solutions? Um, I, I think probably a number of people, of uh, my fellow panelists, have, have talked about the professionalism and the creativity of teachers. Um, and I think that in terms of if you're in leadership in a situation, in a low tech situation, I think I would encourage you to focus your energies on your teachers, um, on encouraging them, on giving them that sense of confidence, that sense of I can do this, uh, you can do this, um, because I think that um, teachers show a, an amazing amount of creativity and I think that you need to encourage those teachers to be creative about the way they engage with their students and obviously they won't be able to engage over technology but there are multiple other ways that they can engage. Um, another question was asked about post-COVID, uh, would we see um, a combination of online versus uh, online and in school teaching. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's undoubtedly going to happen. Um, I think that um, unfortunately schools, um, and it's not just the schooling sector, the education sector, but other sectors often lack behind in the use of technology um, because I think people are afraid of using it and, and staff are unsure how to use it. I, I think we have to accept that um, it is the way forward. Technology is changing our world just as it changed the world completely in the Industrial Revolution. It's going to change our world. So I think we're going to see a combination of um, online and, um, uh, and, and in school teaching. And I would encourage every teacher to, to see it as part of their role um, to develop themselves, have professional development in technology. Don't see it as something on the side, see it as something that is going to be very crucial to your role in future. Um, and if I can, I just finish on this point, which is how we see technology. I loved uh, Magdalena's comments about um, holistic learning, and, and I totally advocate that. At our school, we have outdoor learning and we do lessons outside in the playground and everything, uh, and we, we try to really embrace different aspects. Um, my own uh, pedagogy as a, as a computer science teacher is um, I like to try and see um, technology as, as something that we can use to be creative rather than something we use to consume content. And so when I teach, certainly my subject, I'm always asking the question, how can I um, get my students to use the technology to be creative, not just to consume content that other people have created um, and just read what other people have written, but how can I encourage them to actually um, create something new, like create a PowerPoint presentation, create a, a movie, create a song, uh, create a computer game um, so that, that technology doesn't become something that sort of binds us into a sort of rigid formal way but actually becomes a way of expressing our learning um, in a new way. So I think that probably uh, is me up in terms of my four minutes but I think that is the questions that and the answers that I wanted to give. Fantastic, uh, Pete. Uh, very pointed answers were given. Thank you so much. Thank May you. I uh, request uh, Dr. Aisha to please respond on the questions. Four minutes uh, maximum, please. <clears throat> Perhaps... Uh, uh, losing, yeah, sure. Yes, kids losing the crucial time and uh, disruption and differential. And he is also suggesting that the schools could have probably pre the holidays, help teachers and the schools to build ecosystem before reaching out to uh, students. Uh, let me uh, take the first part of the question first, where he's asking about reacting aggressively on the issue of kids losing on the crucial time. Well, uh, 
why why hello am i am i audible hello you are audible uh, dr aisha okay, okay. May i request all the other uh, speakers to please uh, mute yourself yes thank you now while the while the global homeschooling uh, is surely going to produce some uh, you know inspirational moments uh, some angry moments some fun moments also some frustrated moments but uh, uh, it's very uh, uh, unlikely that uh, it will you know it will replace the learning that is lost from school let's be very realistic about it we are i do understand that uh, you know uh, uh, the fact that children are having a lot of quality time with parents what they were missing on earlier you know uh, being together with parents and think taking uh, it's good to take all these things positively but again as an educator when i look at it realistically i think there is a need for us to be actually aggressively talking about this issue and not only just talking but acting on this issue of children that they are that are losing the the, the crucial you know learning the contact time with their teachers uh the, it, it, we need to understand that the closure of the schools the colleges universities is not only going to interrupt uh the the the, the teaching but it's also coinciding with the key assessment period and as i said earlier many exams have already been postponed or cancelled there is no way that our teachers are able to real time uh, assess uh, the students learning which is so crucial uh, to letting parents uh, know about the progress that the child is making so uh, earlier Uh, the kind of observations that teachers would be able to make in the duration of five to six hours that the child spends at school, that is that is something that is missing. And unless and until we aggressively are going to address this issue of kids losing their contact time, I think uh, this is going to humongously also impact on the differential. I would like to take uh, two studies uh, as case in points here. uh what was uh, uh from uh, uh, you know uh, the 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 study that was uh, uh, you know presented uh by uh, uh, uh one of the assessors uh, this is anderson and nielsen uh, when he looked at the the consequences of uh, students losing uh, their contact time or the real time that they would spend on learning inside the schools uh, uh the, the 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 authors found that the uh, that 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 the scores in particularly in reading and mathematics uh they they differed uh, by 1% and uh, also if we look at uh, the students who get opportunities to spend more contact time more time within their classrooms just before the examinations i think their assessment results considerably uh, have gone high so uh, mr navin i think uh, the, 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 there is a need for us uh, educators to be responding you know in the way that we are responding because uh, we definitely are losing uh, you know uh, running short of time that's one two uh there was uh, the second part of your question that um uh just a second where i lost the question what was that just a second i'm so sorry for this uh, i am so sorry dr ravi could you help me uh, yeah yeah i am uh, so what, is the question by the, uh Mr Naveen right yeah yes uh, he uh, he i think the yes yes no i got it i got it he yeah, says got the it. schools could have probably preponed the holidays yes, yes i think i had i had i had already addressed this uh, in yes. my uh, opening remarks yes uh, the, the the covid 19 pandemic is more of an educational issue it's a health issue and i think the policy makers across the globe have taken right decisions in preponing their holidays because here you are ensuring students health and the child's health child safety and i don't think any school any institution any organization any government in the world would uh, compromise on uh, when it comes to child health and safety so saving lives at this point of time i think was uh, really very important 
and uh, I think pre-podding the holidays was a good option. I think this lockdown, this closing the closure of schools and colleges and universities uh, was uh, definitely the need of the hours. And uh, as far as uh, helping teachers and schools to build ecosystems before reaching out to students, I agree. I 100% agree on this point. I think this uh, is also one of the agenda items of uh, today's webinar, how we can build ecosystems uh, you know, uh, 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 so that we are better able to face such, uh, you know, uh, situations or such crises. Uh, having said that, I think uh, the school leadership also uh, is facing a huge challenge in the way that uh, the way they look at their systems design. When I was talking about redesigning the system, I think we will also have to now look at redesigning and thinking how do we uh, 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 respond in the term of in the times of crisis. It's also about now crisis management, and we as leaders uh, who had been earlier not looking at this issue so seriously, apart from a few of the uh, the drills, the fire drills, and the earthquake drills that happen uh, in the schools regularly. I think it is such crisis also where you never know. Uh, what is awaiting you in uh, today's uncertain world. Uh, we will have to be preparing, also keeping in, uh, you know, a uh, tab on how do we respond to such crisis situations. So, yeah, I, I hope, I, I hope uh, Mr. Naveen, I have answered your question. Yes. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aisha. Thanks for answering the question. Let me uh, move to uh, Samira. Please, uh, answer uh, any relevant question you are seeing. <laughs> you need to unmute uh, yourself, Samira. Yes. Yeah. I have... Um, I know... Um, during this, whether it's a school counseling, personal counseling, like, you know, I, I, I feel the need of this counseling thing in the, in the children or in every school uh, very much. I, I already spoken about it in the, uh, many occasions in our country, but uh, now I get an opportunity to talk in, the, in, in a global platform in the, during this uh, discussion. So I would say that yes, counseling has a real need or demand and online counseling is as good as one-to-one -one counseling. Counseling in terms, in terms of counseling, I don't think that one-to-one -one counseling will help uh, more than an online counseling. Like, you know, so long you are able to um, uh, talk to that very person or talk to that very, very child um, uh, and uh, can uh, able to answer all her or able to answer all her queries or able to help her with information and with uh, an insight of what exactly he or she is looking in or wanting. Uh, that way, I think uh, uh, it's, 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 it, it doesn't matter whether it's a one-to-one -one counseling or a one-to-one uh, uh, counseling or online counseling that way. Uh, in terms of, I would like to, I don't know that, you know, whether uh, I, I really appreciate Dr. Aisha's insight about the questions that the, all, most of the panel, uh, uh, people had. So she gave a very good answer, actually, and she covered all the, all the areas. But I would still like to mention one thing that as, I, as we say it's pandemic, but we should not actually say it's pandemic. We should say it is a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary state that we are in. This COVID-19 actually, yeah, we see it in a, we are in lockdown situation. We are in huge limitation where people are uh, probably all the, uh, all the guests or the fear factor is working. At, in, at this point in time that we may lose out our job or the, the, the payment may uh, 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 get dropped down and uh, we will face a huge difficulty in our uh, employment, in our social life, in our personal life as well. But I think if we see it in that way that, you know, the world needed a rest and we can all think that how best we can actually uh, get the best uh, good things out of it. And after this lockdown gets over, we can actually find out, uh, find a better world, better opportunities, even, even you never know, like, you know, what the world has to offer you uh, uh, tomorrow. So 
that very yes. way i think yes thank you very much thank you thanks sir uh, samira mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. good point that no one knows what's the next day so and just yeah. be prepared <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly uh, exactly may i request uh, magdalena leader to please respond on any of the questions you find relevant yes so uh from Saida, the question is what uh, about the tools to engage children in the active holistic learning through a blended approach in the current challenge. So uh, before I move on to blended approach, let me first uh, outline briefly how it's done in uh, early years uh, uh, provision and also in uh, home learning without uh, too much uh, structured planning. The best tool to engage children in active learning is to uh, organize environment based on play and learning corners or play and learning stations. So uh, as an educator or as a parent, you would have uh, set up a few, three, four, five, it depends on your, your, your space and the, the number of children that you have. You would set up uh, such learning stations around the house or around the, the room or garden. Uh, and each learning station would be devoted to different areas of child development more or less. For example, we can have a creative corner in which children can engage in some um, various creative activities, not only arts and crafts, but various materials through which they can express themselves creatively. Maybe it's uh, more about fine motor skills, but in relation to creative development. Another uh, fantastic learning station could be a construction station where children can build, construct, design from different kinds of materials, not only wooden blocks or plastic blocks, but also maybe if outdoors, it can be wooden planks, it can be buckets, it can be uh, small objects, it can be clay, all kinds of things that allow children to engage uh, in creative using their bodies. Each, um, another corner could be manipulative or reasoning corner where children can engage in even uh, puzzles, all kinds, of, all kinds of things like that, mix and matching, you know, so kind of reasoning things. Uh, so you can have a, a, a cozy corner where children can rest and take time privately. This is very important, especially now when we have the emotional crisis. So even if it's happening at home, you would, you would have such a space where your child can take the time away from the family and also in the earliest provision after COVID, this should be a priority as well. And finally, um, this, uh, a literacy corner, book corner, where a child could reach and pick up from variety of books, yes, on their own, within their own time. And, uh, and uh, one of the very important corner also, grass moral corner, so where children can use the whole body. Uh, outdoor, obviously, it's much easier to organize because you can have uh, a trampoline or some uh, even, you know, uh, balancing board, simple things like to, for, to help children with jumping, with climbing. In a house, if you can have uh, a dedicated small place, even with cushions or simple mat or, or dancing or music, where you can, and children can do this. And one of the important things is to, uh, to have these spaces open all the time accessible all the time to children so they can decide when they want to engage in this uh, and what kind of corner they feel drawn to at any given time whether it's an earliest provision or a house and now if we move on to blended learning if you can use technology as a trigger so for example we can have an application for children about construction yes constructing a crane or um, so children engage in this kind of uh, learning on the laptop or, or a, a tablet and spend some time with it. And then this should create a bridge to uh, some active learning in the house, in the garden, or for example, in a construction corner. So yes, inspired with the technological solution, a child can go and try to build a crane or, or something else, yes? So this is what I think um, one of you mentioned, uh, I think uh, Pete in, the, in, in his addressing the question. Uh, in, getting inspiration from technology. And this way we can move forward as using technology as a beautiful tool and address, address holistic learning at the same time. And there's plenty of cross curricular and even academic learning outcomes uh, present and available every single day. So this would be my, my summary uh, uh, on a practical side for both educators and, and parents. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent uh, inputs about the various corners in the house and using each corner for a different activity, different uh, types of focus. Great idea. 
Thank you so much. May I uh, request uh, Olga to please respond on the questions, please? Uh -huh. uh, how can we well just uh, feel after COVID-19? I mean, in the case of, um, well, system uh, all over the world. I think in the cooperation will help us because uh, as for today panel and uh, all panelists, uh, I'm so grateful for, well, just to be here and listen to all of you. Uh, I think the cooperation help us uh, just to be the best uh, in our steps uh, just to organize uh, education all over the world because uh, we knew that uh, Education as we had before COVID and education we are having now, well, quite different world well, justice systems, yeah. Uh, mostly we are online teaching. And as for uh, some problems we have, our rural areas don't have uh, internet uh, and uh, some families don't have uh, computers or so, so something else. But uh, we should now, I think, uh, have in good, well, just how to say it, uh, in good impact, well, just to use uh, this and that. And I think the cooperation, uh, cooperation of all, all of us will be, well, just helpful. Uh, just, uh, it is very interesting to know how we all work uh, in our schools and uh, what can uh, the management of uh, education be organized uh, in a better way, I think this way. Great. Thank you, Olga. Very important inputs from you. May I request uh, Nargis of Kambata to please respond to the questions? Please unmute uh, Nargis. Yeah, is that better? I'm yes. yes. Um, actually, thank God for the mute button. Um, <laughs> So um, the, I picked up a couple, I think, from um, Tarannum, Naveen, and Deepak. Uh, three questions, two of them which have a similar uh, you know, thread of logic, and one that's slightly different. Um, so I think I'm going to talk about the, the involvement of parents. I think both Naveen and uh, Tarannum have asked about the involvement of parents. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. They say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. For sure it does. Um, and so parents mothers as they say are the first teachers for the for the children so i think it's very important especially in early childhood i'm sure magdalene Mag, magdalene will agree with me that it is important for uh, parents to be educated and trained some for some parents it just comes naturally uh, for others um, it needs some sort of coaching um, and so i'm i'm I, I saw somebody from stepping stones in here uh, which is a quite a well-known nursery in uh, school in, uh, in Delhi. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that all schools undertake some form of training for parents when they come in. Um, you know, even whether it's phonetics and phonemes for little children or, uh, you know, in whatever form you, you're undertaking, simple things like even even counseling for parents helps and how do you get your child, I, th I think it was Magdalene who, who talked about how it's important to, you know, de-link the role of the parent and the teacher, she very clearly said that. But if as a parent, you are going to, um, you know, help in the education of your child, and many, many parents um, love doing that, um, you know, if, the, if that's not causing stress to you, then if you're not trained, it's just good for a school to conduct that training. So I, I totally agree with you that, yes, parents should be um, trained before they're involved. Also, some, some Tarunum, I think, asked a very insightful question of the AFL, and I wasn't clear what you meant. But if uh, AFL are assessments for learning, and these assessments for learning are effectively used by the teacher to know where is that shortfall in the learning? Uh, how is, what has the child understood? And then the, child, the teacher then adapts accordingly. It's like making a biryani, you know? Uh, while cooking, you, you add the salt and then you add the spices, and then you taste it and you say, mm, uh, I think the masala is a little less. And you put a little masala in there or you add a little more uh, you know, uh, salt. So um, that's what your AFLs are for. It's actually to gauge how well your children are learning. And today, uh, input from parents is important. You've got, again, I'm sorry, I'm referring to technology, but there are tools like Seesaw, 
where a parent can upload or a child can upload, uh, you know, activities being done, all the wonderful activities that they talked about, uh, which can be done in the house, low technology, can be then with the simple help of a smartphone, can then be uploaded. Um, you don't need, I mean, everyone's got access to a smartphone these days. And then you can upload, uh, you know, those um, activities for the teacher to see. I do, I do want to advise, especially for those of you who've got young parents, uh, young children, uh, there is, if you're on Instagram, there is a um, wonderful um, Instagram account called the Dad Lab. The Dad Lab, D A D L A B. Uh, please follow this uh, account, and he does. He's homeschooling his children. This is his voice, and he's doing some amazing, amazing work on Instagram. So that's as far as parents go and their involvement in education. And Deepak, you asked a question after my own heart. You said, do away with the ranking system. Throw the exams out of the board. Oh my goodness me. I'm giving you a virtual hug. Absolutely, please. Yes, good night. I couldn't agree more. Um, in fact, that's the single most uh, important cause for stress in a student's life. Um, but, but obviously, we can't do that. We be careful what we wish for. You cannot do that without having some sort of an alternative. And so while we're all for, that's why you see that most of the up to 40% of our of our report cards come from form, comes from formative um, assessments, and formative assessments really are on the go where there's no stress for them to learn. It's just how are they performing at that point in time, and you know from the questions they ask, from the responses they give, etc. Um, if we don't have a formal exam system, what is the alternative? That's the question to ask. Many people have shifted to project-based learning and challenge-based learning, which are very, very exciting. And I think educators all over the world are being challenged with this one question. If not final exams, then what? Um, the IB has, has got a really good system where they've got internal assessments as well to back that up. Um, and, and we're on a quest. We don't have all the answers, uh, but certainly where we feel that this is a stress point, um, educators are having sleepless nights. And with that, I'll hand over back to Dr. Gupta. Great, uh, I guess uh, uh, you always have uh, great inputs to provide. And uh, let's uh, move up to Sapna to answer some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, so I just picked up questions which were more related to India. Um, this was by Vinod Kumar Yadav. He has two questions, Vinod. So both were, and Vinod and Ajit had two questions which were pertaining to training. So Vinod had this, is current training pattern able to accommodate uh, serve the requirement education in the current scenario? And what is the position of the ongoing teachers, friends in India? Uh, Vinod, so yes, when this COVID-19 happened, we were already, most of the schools, we were already taking the tra training sessions, preparing people for preparing teachers for what's going to come ahead. We were training them for 21st century skills, which were, which included one of the skills, which was critical thinking, problem solving, and all the skills which I mentioned in my previous slide that we were teaching all this to the teachers. So I'm sure that this will be very effective while they are planning their lesson plans while they are planning their strategies. And now all that, whatever we have been teaching uh, physically has come online. So we are doing a lot of training uh, online with schools, with uh, discovering more options. We are open that we'll be, um, there are many trainers like me and teachers who are uh, accepting. So the whole day we are training through the laptop, through uh, certain mediums for uh, uh, tra training will be happening and is happening through digital media. This is the way forward. This is the new world. Uh, regarding what will happen, what is the requirement uh, which accommodates uh, education in the current scenario I've answered. What is the position of the ongoing teachers? Teachers as uh, Nargis and Aisha and FP, everyone is saying that they are still in the process to adapt this change. We all are just in the process of making mistakes thinking how to go forward. So I'll say that we are learning each day and every day is a new learning. So whatever will develop will take time, but whatever we can offer, we are there to offer and we have been offering online training to different schools, different uh, platforms. The second question was very interesting by Ajit Kumar Singh, which is non-technology solutions in rural area. So as we all know that India is so vast that Rural area is this a very important factor because we do not have technology. Uh, there is technology, but people cannot access to that 
limit with way we are all talking when pete is talking about uk that uk also has this problem of technology access so imagine in india in rural sectors so how will we go the non technology way in india so i had a uh, opportunity to be in one of the uh, states in madhya pradesh that's madhya pradesh where we were before this lockdown happened we were not it wasn't there anywhere we knew this just a month before that we were discussing with the government that how we can impart education this kind of 21st century to the rural area how the government was negotiating in a bigger way that how uh, the rural development the rural belt of every state will come up and we were planning all the principal workshop the teachers workshop um almost i'll say 30% uh, work was done with one of the state governments and this happened so i think after this uh, academic uh, this pandemic uh, we will see that academics are taken care and i'm sure like the way our delhi government is doing such fantab uh, fantastic work in terms of education because we are replicating or we are trying to do this kind of model in all the rural areas of every state after this um, i think more budget will be allocated for uh, rural area where digital media will be one of the factors till then uh, let's concentrate on what is their present what is the present scenario let's save lives i'll say uh, th that is more important because people have to be educated that it's so important to be, what is social distance distancing and what is uh, what is the high, why are we doing this uh, hygiene what is it all about because in india rural sector because uh, we have people from rural belt and people are not even aware of social distancing they are thinking it's just like one of the malaria or one of the dengue fevers which will go very soon so let's first make them aware at our level how to educate them that to get first uh, get uh, let's make them prepare with this what is happening today um, education will follow uh, their learning will follow First, let us educate them what is happening today because that's a crisis in india where we are struggling and uh, trying to educate each and everybody that how this thing is so so important for us to be safe today so uh, let's wait your answer will come very soon just wait for few months thank you fantastic so i think uh, we we have reached at the end, uh, uh, almost the end of the session and uh, i have to thank uh, all the panelists you have been amazing and in fact i have learned a lot and uh, i would like to request each of you to please uh, write an article on this covid situation and how does education sector deal with it and we would love to publish it on our uh, online portal digital learning yeah i'll do that i'll do that so uh, ravi says his life is uh, it was still you know so let me conclude this session on behalf of elets on behalf of digital media on behalf of ravi gupta and the entire elets team who has been coordinating for all of you and they have been instrumental in bringing all of us together and your your suggestions your uh, advices will be very much taken i think i guess there were thousands of spectators who were watching us who were live today thank you so much please write an article and share it with us we will be happy to publish it on behalf of elets team and on behalf of um, everybody in india thank you so much for joining us thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye thank you very much thank you